everybody. Welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast. For more information on the vision, programs, and news of our church, be sure to check us out at www.newmarketalliance.ca. We'd like to encourage you as well that no podcast, no matter how good, can substitute for the experience of joining together in person at a worship celebration. That's where God really meets people, often through the love and ministry of others. At NAC, we meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Now let's join this week's teaching. So I I wonder if maybe you have some God stories that you'd want to share, particularly if you have a story about God at work outside these walls, Uh, maybe stories of um, of sharing sharing the good news in in large and small ways and we won't belabor it if if nobody does or if you're too nervous but i'd love to hear from somebody if they have a a little praise report is there anybody jacob voth yeah man all right so i'm still shaky because i get shaky when i'm on stage so i'm gonna sit so do you want me to get an oxygen tank or anything? <laughs> sure, yeah. <clears throat> but um, for a lot, like a lot of my childhood, I was bullied for being a Christian, just like blatantly by people in my schools. And it was just, it took a toll on me to say the least. And I just kind of shrunk down and stopped talking to people really. And I was just like the biggest introvert that would just not even talk to anybody about Jesus, especially. And uh, recently after the rock retreat with uh, Glenn, when we went out to plan for the year, we talked about, a lot about uh, being missionaries and inviting people to the youth group. And um, I had a hard time with doing that, but because of all of the backlash that I've got and it was just a hard concept for me to grasp and just by the goodness of God I invited one of my camp friends who lives in Vaughn to the youth group somehow and uh, he was just the most loving about it and he took like a two hour bus ride down to come to this youth group and he ended up getting back at like midnight it was (laughs) it was a lot and he loves this church so much and I it was just such an encouragement for me to go from if you talk about Jesus, people will make fun of you and hate you to this guy going out of his way and now he wishes that he could come every week and it's just such a blessing for me, I think. Amen. That'll preach, buddy. That's great. That's great. Anybody else? Going once. Going twice. Julie, friends. This is Julie, everybody. Good morning. Yesterday, we had the pleasure to be at uh, Crosslands Church, I guess, to serve the needy. Uh, Thank you to Sherry, who organized it so well. Who are you? Uh, Awesome. They loved it. They said, I had the privilege to talk to people. um, Mingle, sorry, I'm nervous. I didn't want to speak, but I feel I have to because amazing things took place. Uh And so people were like, oh, you're so many people here. I've, we haven't seen any, like, so many people here before. So that was a, a big encouragement from the start. After that, it was just like a, nice to listen to them and hear their story, meeting a Christian here and a Christian there among the guests or people who just needed to talk prayer for something. So we prayed, and then they were thankful. And then I met this lady, uh, lady from Trinidad who's a solid Christian just is going through some financial difficulty telling me about her story from her kids who two of them three of them are in Trinidad and she's trying to have them coming here and anyway she was so appreciative as I was talking to her she was like ah this song ah thank you Lord it's such a blessing it was I think the one about water under the bridge Oh, bridge over trouble, yeah. Yeah, whatever. So I was like, <laughs> I don't know this song. It's not one. What is it? Bridge over troubled water, yeah. Oh, bridge over troubled water. Yeah. It's better. And so she, we had to pause talking, and we, she was just soaking it in, and she was saying, saying, thank you, Lord. I just needed to hear the song. Thank you, Lord. Oh. 
and she goes to a church in Keswick. And she was so thankful for the opportunity to be there. And as I listened to her, I prayed for her, and then she prayed with me. And at the end, she was like, ah, oh, it was such a blessing to be here. It, she made my day. For me, it was like, wow, thank you, Lord. To use different people, she was like enjoying the music, enjoying the waiters, the food. She says, ah, oh, this food is so good. So thank you, everybody. It was Amen. really something. Amen. It yeah. was. It was. Amen. <clears throat> You would have been so proud, church, of our, of our people, people behind the scenes, people in front of the scenes, serving in different ways, and people feeling, I'm sure they were scared, but bold enough to say, uh, can I pray for you? Can I pray for your healing? Yeah, yeah. And, um, it was just beautiful to observe. Um, Jessica. I didn't want to do this, and I was just going to keep playing so I didn't have to, but... Um, do you want me to... No, I'm up? just going to get off the stage. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. <laughs> Good one. Um, so on Friday, um, I had the opportunity of going back to my former school that I was at before, and um, there was a student there who I hadn't seen since, um, I guess, like, last year, and I had been told that she was struggling... Um, with anxiety and depression and that she was talking about um, suicide and she had been contemplating it and she just got a lot going on. So I saw her and she ran up and gave me a big hug and then I said, how's it going? And then she sort of started to cry and I thought, oh gosh, okay. I said, let's go, let's go talk. So we went over to the stairwell and so we just started to talk and um, she was sharing kind of the struggles that she was experiencing right now and that she was having these panic attacks and she just is having a hard time. And, and so I remember that she had t told me before that on Friday she goes to youth group. So I thought, okay, do I say something? Do I not? Like, such a touchy, like, place as a teacher to bring up, like, do you bring up faith? Do you not? Obviously, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to be neutral. But I just thought, you know what? I know this about this girl. So I said, oh, well, have you spoken to anyone at youth group about it? And then her whole face just, like, lit up. And she said, no, I haven't. And I said, well, that, I said, that might be good. Like, if these people know you and they know, like, they know your heart and they know that, like, you're, and then I'm like, do I say Christian? Do I not? And then I just said, if they know you're a Christian, like, maybe it's good for them to be there to support you. And she's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then I said, and again, I'm like, do I say this? Do I not? I said, have you prayed about this? And then she said, well, a little. And I said, you know what? Like, I think that's what, like, that's what you need to do. Like, in these moments when you're feeling these panic attacks, like, pause, and why don't you just pray and ask God to give you the breath you need. Ask God to give you the whatever you need to get through that moment. And so I said, and I'm going to be praying for you. And then she kind of, like, turned and smiled. So it was just a neat moment where it, it's out of my, like, normal realm of being a teacher, but I just felt like, wow, like, this was the connection that she needed. Um, yeah, so that was kind of a cool experience. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> this, is, this is what I'm talking about. These are not, these are not um, dramatic conversations in some ways. They come up organically, and, and we all can do it. Um, one more? Is that? Ah, Paul. Uh, hi. I was just talking to Keith West at the break there. And, uh, you know, it was a year and a half ago I was still trying to figure out how to walk. You know, I was still in the walker, which is really amazing. The interesting thing, I've been at work on site now for just over a year. The interesting thing about where I am is there are 240 people that walk by my office door. I'm in charge of the facility and maintaining the building. And... Um, since last March, we had this, uh, I spoke, and um, it's on our podcast, on our uh, website, so if you want to go and hear it, it's, it's there. Um, but I've shared that with about 10 or 12 different people in the office, particularly one Muslim lady that came by, and she was very interested in listening to it. And she came back with a very positive response. And, uh, you know, I am in a unique position where I am. 
And even my supervisor says, you know, we're naming and tagging all the places in the building. I says, I think we're going to put Pastor Paul on <laughs> your door. So, because I have a lot of people that come into my space, and we spend some uh, very... Uh, very relevant and very deep conversations about all sorts of matters. So uh, the Lord is there in our building, Amen. and I'm glad to represent him and to share the gospel with as many that come into my space. Amen. Amen. Good word, brother. Aren't you glad you don't have to manipulate and cajole and strong-arm people into the kingdom of heaven? And, and if that's what you heard in this series, I am so sorry. Um, I am so sorry that you weren't listening because that is not uh, what was communicated. Um, it was my dad's birthday last week. I made a beeline out of the service and, and sort of made it to Kitchener where we celebrated his 75th birthday. And my mom, as she does on significant birthdays, made a little scrapbook. And uh, it kind of was nostalgic for me and it reminded me of this time where I, you know, me and my sister were young, like maybe, maybe three and six, and um, he would put us on the kitchen counter, and sometimes like facing away, and say, "Now, do you trust Daddy?" Yeah, I trust Daddy. I just, do you do you love Daddy? Yeah, I love Daddy. Well, do you trust that Daddy will catch you? Yeah, I trust Daddy will catch. You. So, <laughs> fall back, and I would fall back. <gasps> And Daddy's big arms would catch me, and he'd put my sister up there and go, "Do you, do you trust Daddy?" Yeah, I trust Daddy. Do you believe he'll catch you? Yeah, I believe it. Well, then just fall back. No, Daddy, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so the lesson is, is that I'm more spiritual than my sister. <laughs> um, I, I, I did that with with my girls growing up, and I. I think my dad was just trying to create a sermon illustration on Saturday when uh, uh, time was getting short before Sunday. But today I want to remind you that you can trust your dad. You can trust your father in heaven. You can trust him even with the people that you love the most. And so on this, the last uh, teaching of this series, I, I want to wrap up by asking you, you know, after all the challenges that I've given you to share Jesus outside the walls of this building, I want the last word you hear to be, now trust God with the results. Because um, guess what? We can't do it. We can't do it. Evangelism is something really only the Father can ultimately do. And so what I'd like to remind you of today is that God is already active, at work in evangelism. God goes ahead of us. Uh, God is already there. And, and before you even thought about bringing a friend to Christ, before you thought of praying for your neighbor or your relative, God was already witnessing to that person. You know how he does that? Well, he does it in several ways, actually. Here's one way he does it. Look outside, you know, an Ontario autumn. We're moving into winter. He witnesses through his, his, the glorious things that he has made. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, turn to Romans 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. We're going to look at a bunch of different Bible passages today. And let's just look at God's role in the process of evangelizing. Romans 1.18 and the following says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So I've underlined suppress the truth. There is a truth emanating from the heart of God, and the whole world um, can hear it and see it and feel it, but there are those who want to suppress it. And, and here's, here's what it goes on to say. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his external power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. So God the evangelist is already at work. He's displaying himself in the world. First of all, he does it through creation, through beauty. How many have been to the Grand Canyon? Oh, man. Can you remember the first time? 
oh, there's a good-looking uh, family right there, <laughs> that you looked over that guardrail, and it was this mix of, of awe and terror and excitement and unspeakable beauty. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but there was this movie in the 90s uh, called Grand Canyon. It had Steve Martin and um, Kevin Klein, and there was these overlapping stories that kind of illustrate the brokenness of humanity and, and the failing systems and the inability of government and, and even families to sort of hold life together. And so there's this scene I remember, Danny Glover is a, is a mechanic, and he sits on a street corner next to Kevin Klein, whose BMW had, had uh, broken down in a dangerous part of town. And Glover's character sits there, and they sort of lament over life and society. And his eyes kind of glisten, and he says, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Like, get yourself to the Grand Canyon, because... God's love, God's power, God's majesty, God's common grace is wonderfully on display. And it's in a world that is desperately in need of hope. So desperately in need of beauty from God. He's making himself known through creation, through beauty. I think I, think I know enough about Helen Agalawadi to know that God is revealed to her in part, at least, when she goes outside. And she'll go with a bunch of, of artists and they'll bring their easels and they'll bring their paint and they'll find a place outside. This is not a group of Christians, by the way. This is Helen taking Jesus outside the building and having non-Christians uh, as, just as friends to love. And whether or not the topic of God comes up, I believe the beauty of creation witnesses to their spirit. God is already there. You know another place where we see the God who's already there, we see it in people. We see it, we see God in the Imago Dei of people. Um, you look in the face of a baby and tell me that there's no God. I mean, come on. You look, as that little child grows in Brittany and in Maddie, like, uh, it testifies to the invisible qualities, the external power and divine nature of God, the awesomeness of kids testify to God. Vicky started writing down the wonderful and ridiculous things our kids would say at age, you know, three and four, and I'm so glad she did. I would have forgotten, because they were, I mean, they were just little comedy factories, uh, and so much of it is a blur. You know, we had three toddlers and this giant three-seated stroller. It looked like the circus had come to town, you know? And, and one supper, Rosa, four years old, says, Mommy, I want peas with no butter. And little Gracie pipes up with her three-year-old cartoon voice and was like, Mommy, I want peas with yes butter. I was like, I mean, if you don't believe in God after a line like that, after having kids, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I like how the message translation of Psalm 8 goes. It says, nursing infants gurgle courses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. Now, the natural question that follows is why? Why does God give all this beauty and display himself in the world? Well, that's point number two. God is the primary seeker of the lost. The word seeker is, um, is kind of a loaded term in church world. Um, in the mid-80s, most churches were, were kind of the same, kind of boring, kind of serious, mostly filled with insider language for insider people, fairly formal. And then a few churches, Knack being one of the early adopters of this, started saying, hey, what if we made church interesting to those who don't like church, but might be spiritually seeking. And so the seeker church movement began, and it ushered in drums and, and electric guitar and um, you know great dramas and lighting, and the music sounded like stuff you heard on the radio, and you know the pastor wore khakis and a golf shirt, and, and, thing, and, and it spoke about things that were actually applicable 
to people's lives, like marriage and career and hopes and dreams. And now, 30 years later, most Protestant churches kind of look like that. And so it started with this idea that we make church accessible to the seeker, the, the, the one who is seeking for spiritual answers. And this, I think, has overall been a, a good thing, I think. But I want to tell you, if we're, if we're being technically accurate, God is actually the first seeker, the real seeker. God is actually the primary seeker. Because listen to me, before any of us ever sought God, God was seeking you. That's the truth. Look at what the prophet Ezekiel says in chapter 34. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. And then you look at the mission of Jesus in Luke 19. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. The reason God displays himself in this world, the reason God goes ahead of us is because God is a seeking God. He's constantly seeking the lost. Have you ever, have you ever lost a kid or someone, parents, you ever lost a kid? It's freaky deaky, right? Like I was, I was four years old and in some department store that probably no longer exists, and I, I don't know if they still have these, but they have these circle type hanger deals, right? And, and I thought it would be cool to sort of like just hide out in the, uh, make it a little tent, you know, in preteen maternity or wherever I was uh, hiding out there. And, uh, and, and, and next thing I know, it was like the rapture happened and my, no, there was, my mom was gone. Well, this lady uh, pulled me over to the counter and she, I remember her saying over the loudspeaker, there's a little boy here who's missing his mom. And um, I was fine. Like, I, I wasn't worried. But I remember seeing my mom come with this, this face is still stuck with me, this panicked face of like, you know what that's like, right? And some of you have had even scarier experiences than that. But, you know, maybe grasp the heart of God a bit in that illustration that what the God is, what God is doing 24 hours a day, a 24-7 seeking God, seeking his people, a God who the poet uh, Francis Thompson famously coined as the hound of heaven, a pursuing God, a chasing God, a God who is seeking. You know, the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son in Luke 15 is all about the nature of God who drops everything to seek the one. And I'm so glad for that. I, I, I mean, I have had the privilege, I guess, uh, to, to, to be in a stadium to witness, for all intents and purposes, thousands of people come to Christ. But the, you know, the angels in heaven rejoice every time just one comes to know Jesus because God is an evangelist. And as much as you believe that you were seeking God, it turns out he was seeking you way before. That's the nature of God is that he is an initiator. Um, you know, the atheist turned Christian C.S. Lewis writes, I never had the experience of looking for God. It was the other way around. He was the hunter. I was the deer. He stalked me took unerring aim and fired. God is a seeking God. Okay, so point one, God goes ahead. He's already there. Point two, why? Because he is a seeking God. Now, a lot of you are saying, ha, huzzah, I don't have to evangelize. Uh, no, I, that's uh, perhaps get your hearing aid checked because that's, you have missed uh, what has been said for the last nine weeks. So point number three, God includes us in the work of the gospel. He does it in a couple ways. First and foremost, we are included through the work of prayer. Um, friends, I appeal to you to, to understand that our role in evangelism begins with the task of prayer. What does it be? Begin with prayer. Uh, mm. uh, friends, what does it be? Begin with prayer. prayer. Okay, and look, ultimately, Evangelism is a 
supernatural activity that takes place between God and a soul. And it happens really in this unseen world, in this supernatural realm. And there's all kinds of evil that seeks to thwart God's initiative. And I don't, I don't begin to understand it all, but I agree with, with Lewis when he says every square inch in the universe is being fought for, taken by Satan, countertaken by God. Evangelism is the activity that we're engaged in, but what occurs is really a mystery. The Bible says it all over the place. It uses this Greek word, um, mysteria or mysterion. It's the mystery of the gospel. How can one even really um, articulate the transformation of a heart, the conversion of a heart? It occurs in this supernatural, unseen realm. You know, the, the invisible act of regeneration um, it happens through this visible act of evangelism. And, and from what we know of the scriptures, there's this war going on that we don't even see. And it's a war waged for your best friend and for your kid and for your mom and for your sister. Here's what 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Blinded, spiritual blinding, unable to see. You know, the late Billy Graham couldn't convince someone who was spiritually blind. I don't care if you're Stephen Furtick or Andy Stanley or Rick Warren or the Pope himself. If, if you have been spiritually blinded, that is a supernatural thing that really only God can correct. The Apostle Paul says our first activity in the work of the gospel is the work of prayer. First Timothy 2, Paul says to Timothy, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf. Why? Because this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Pray for everyone. Why? Because God desires all to be saved. Somehow, in the mysterion, the mystery of the gospel, the prayers of the saints, that's all y'all, you know that? The saints actually participate, actually make a difference in the divine work of God. So pray. Paul says, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is that they will be saved. Personal prayer. Are you praying for your neighborhood yet? Are you praying for them by household, by name? Prayer evangelism. You know, I asked you this nine weeks ago at the beginning of this series, and now I'm going to ask you again at the end of this series. By the way, maybe the end of the series is definitely not the end of our mission, of our challenge, not by a long shot. But if Jesus were to say to us today, I'm going to grant every prayer. I'm going to say yes to every prayer that you prayed this last week. Um, would there be any new souls in the kingdom? Would there be any new Christians because of the prayers that we have prayed? It seems like every great move of God, every revival has started with a praying church praying for souls. We, we are climbing on the backs of people like Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and Wesley and the Scots who began this first great concert of prayer movement. You know, through Edwards' council, the Scots had a dream that every week in every church there would be one prayer meeting with half of it devoted to praying for people who don't know Jesus. And every quarter, all the churches of the town would come together to pray to God to reach lost people. The great um, Moravian prayer movement had believers gather from all over Europe and they started a prayer meeting that went 24 hours a day for 100 years uh, because God was telling them to do it and that birthed what's known as the Great Awakening. So prayer. Second thing is we are included in these I'll call them divine appointments. I want to share uh, with you six big little words. This blew me away, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Paul is dealing with a situation where 
believers are saying, well, Paul, you know, brought them to Christ. Or actually, no, Apollos brought me to Christ, and he's trying to get away from that because he knows ultimately God is the evangelist. And so here in verse 5, he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants. And here come the words. Through whom you have, sorry, through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. As the Lord assigned to each. Whoa, you mean I didn't lead somebody to Christ? No, it's big D, divine, little a, appointment, okay? Big D, divine, little a, me, appointment, assignment. God has set them up for us. They were set up for Paul. They were set up for Apollos. They're set up for me. Um, They're set up for you. God has your appointment book. He's got access to it. And make no mistake, like, it's no mistake where you work or the friends you have or the neighborhood you live in. Divine appointments. The goal of every mature believer is to get to the place where we don't miss the appointment. And like I've said, you know, um, if I'm going to practice this along with you, I've got my work cut out for me because I'm, I'm in Christian culture all the time. Christian people everywhere. I can't throw a rock without hitting a Christian. And <laughs> I'm like, even I'm trying to convert people who have already, I'm like, Brittany, are you sure that you're a Christian? Because we could pray a prayer right now. I'm like, you're sure? Oh, darn it. And like last night <laughs> at, the, uh, at, the, at the soup kitchen, I'll call it, um, Somebody came up to me uh, and said, uh, man, I would have never pegged you for a pastor. And I was like, oh, that's the nicest thing everyone has ever said to me. <clears throat> you know what? I have uh, had really interesting opportunities to share my faith. Well, some of it, quite frankly, has come from this role, this calling, this, uh, this platform, literally and figuratively. People have have brought their friend to church, and I get this profound privilege of being the communicator uh, of the message of Jesus, you know? Not many of you get to give an uninterrupted speech to a room full of people. It's a, it's a privilege. Or getting to be the guy at the funeral, or the hospital, or the pre-marriage, or the wedding, or the counseling office, where people are actually coming to me, expecting me to give spiritual input. So I get this, you know, unspeakable good fortune of, of people sometimes coming to me simply because of my title. But apart from that, do you know where two of the best environments have been for me to have spiritual conversation? This may only be for me, but it's been at the, the barber slash hairstylist and at the sports bar. Something about somebody, you know, touching your head and neck with scissors in one hand. I don't know. Um, And honestly, because I'm an introvert, believe it or not, uh, sometimes I hope that the stylist is just so engrossed with, you know, my beautiful hair (laughs) that they'll forget to make small talk. Um, But sometimes it's divine appointments, man. And, and so they'll ask uh, what I do. And then I'll decide right there if I want to tell them truthfully what I do. And sometimes I will tell them I'm a pastor. And then maybe they'll tell me about their mom that just passed away. And ask what I think about an afterlife. And other times they'll barely hide their contempt. And it'll become clear that they're angry at God or the church or Christians. And that's when the conversation gets really interesting. I had somebody who um, was openly scornful, mocking. This was a this was a boss of mine actually back back uh, before I was in ministry, and there was a part of me that wanted to go toe to toe because I felt I could. You know, if we got into an intellectual apologetics thing, I felt like I could have crushed him under the weight of my uh, brilliance. (laughs) Um, And these times, I I must confess, happen rarely. But I felt the Spirit of God uh, asking me to do something else. And so I said, um, 
I'm so sorry. He, it sounds like you must have had a really lousy church experience. And his countenance just changed. And his eyes welled up. Well, it turns out he was a PK. And, <laughs> and had had a horrible experience. Well, guess who became his favorite employee? Who the guy who just sort of shared life with. And I don't know t- today where his soul is at. But something happened in that moment where I became a a confidant and a person he could talk to. Do you know in the People's Republic of China, the largest nation in the world, over a billion people, uh, there is what is called the Three Self Church. Now, I may be getting my details wrong, and somebody could correct me later. I don't think I am, but this is the state-approved Christian church. So the the Chinese government can safely say, yeah, we allow religion, we allow Christianity, we have freedom. And if you ever get a chance to go to the Three Self Church, you'd probably sing some hymns and you'd uh, maybe read a little bit from the Bible and say a prayer and maybe even hear a little bit of, of Bible teaching. It may all seem like pretty standard Christian stuff, actually, but here's the thing. They're not allowed to evangelize. That's part of the deal with the state, okay? You can do your thing as long as your thing doesn't include sharing the gospel. Now, there are tens of millions of Christians in China who have chosen not to be part of the three self church and instead meet at great risk in illegal house churches because they're so convinced that you can't be a Christian unless you share your faith. They say that the two just go together. And if you don't share your faith, you're not a Christian as far as the New Testament is concerned. I want you to know, too, that God joins us in evangelism. Is this scary? Oh, man. Yeah, it's scary. I am a, I'm a professional Christian. I've studied theology. I get paid to do this. I mean, heck, if, if all goes to plan... This message that I'm preaching right now is actually going to be on the radio in Africa. Like, I'm kind of a big deal, right? (laughs) And let me tell you something. Sharing my faith scares the living daylights out of me, okay? And I think that's part of this unseen battle, this satanic warfare that would tempt us with fear. And... If you're afraid about point number three, let me just bring you to point number four. God joins us in these appointments, okay? What are the last words Jesus gave us? And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So God's presence is so true in evangelism that Jesus says to his disciples, I'm sending you out like wolves in sheep's clothing. And you're like, I knew it. But he says, When you're there, you're not even going to have to think about what you're going to say. God is so present that the very words we need are going to be given to us. So in that divine appointment, in the sports bar, you know, watching on the big screen, uh, two men stripped to the waist in a steel cage trying to knock each other out, somehow the conversation with strangers, no less, turns to spiritual things. And God is right there feeding me the lines. It's incredible. Have you ever had that experience of sharing Christ with somebody? And then you go home and realize, I just talked to somebody about Jesus, and I have no idea what I just said. It felt like it, felt like it wasn't even me saying it. Well, according to Scripture, it may not have been you saying it. Um, I, said, uh, I said really all I wanted to say about this last week. So if you, if you missed it, please listen to the podcast. But the Holy Spirit is going to give you everything you need to communicate the gospel. He's going he's to give you everything you need to show and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And he'll do it with power. So point one, God's the evangelist who's already there. Point two, he does that because he's a seeker. Point three, he includes us in the mission. Point four, he says, hey, I think I'll come along with you. Last thing, and then we'll close. This is what I really want to tell you this morning. This is what I, I want to leave you with after nine weeks of, of talking about Jesus leaving the building. Here it is. God is responsible for the results. You are not responsible, okay? 
okay? God is. Our role is the role of witness. We can't save anybody. When it comes to the saving of a soul, when it comes to this mysterion of the gospel, that's God's territory, okay? The best we get to do is watch as God completely transforms someone, gives them new life, gives them new birth. It says in John 6, this is Jesus speaking, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws that person in. You know, that word draw is used later in John and it's translated a little differently in, in English as drag. And uh, it's the same word when it says, they dragged the nets in the boat. So if you think of it that way, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me, you know, Star Wars tractor beams, unless the Father who sent me drags that person. And you say, that, that, that can't be right. That doesn't sound right. I say, well, here's what Scripture says. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, not even one. There is no one who seeks God, not even one. So this pursuing God and the mystery of the gospel and the free grace of Christ and the fact that Jesus is so utterly compelling and beautiful is what draws people in. It, it doesn't mean he puts a guns to, people, to people's head. It just means he is the source of salvation. He's the initiator of our salvation. He's the pursuer of our salvation. He won't say our yes for us, but he's pursuing us. It's a God thing. Take this good news outside the building, and when we go, he joins us. And then he says, especially to us control freaks, hey, just leave the results to me. So the pressure's off, folks. This is not the hyper-competitive salesman meeting of Glen Gary, Glen Ross, ABC, always be closing the deal. You don't have to worry about it. God is the one who closes the deal. I think somebody here this morning just had a weight taken off them because it finally hit them that the salvation of their spouse, of their kid, of their parent, of their sibling does not depend on them. And so to the mother, to the father, worried about the soul of their kid this morning, for the one worried about their spouse or their friend, keep praying. Keep being open to opportunities. Keep letting God create these divine appointments and just trust that he is planting seeds. He's using Jesus' witnesses that you don't even know about, okay? And you can leave the results to God. And here's the best part. As worried as you are about their eternal destiny. And I'll be honest, I've sometimes thought, like, I'm not sure I want to spend eternity in heaven if it means being separated from my girls or my wife. But you need to know as much as you love your family, your friends, you don't love them near as much as God loves them. And God uh, has a good plan for them. You think you have a good plan for them. Let me tell you, God has a good plan plan for them. You can't even imagine the good plans that God desires for them. So leave them with God. Trust them with God. You know, uh, statistician David Barrett suggests that today and every day, 75,000 to 100,000 people are going to accept Jesus as their Savior, come into the kingdom of God. Big D, divine, little a, us, appointments. That's evangelism. We invite the band as we respond. God, um, we just want to trust you with the results. And having said that, I pray that you would give us the privilege of divine appointments because our ears, our eyes are open. May they come one after another, people actually asking us, like, why are you being so kind? What? What do you believe about the afterlife? Um, Would you pray for me? Because I'm going through a tough time. Lord, would you open those doors, I pray. And so we continue to pray for these names written down on the canvas. We thank you for these bells hanging, which represent each of them, a story 
a baby step, uh, living faith in the real world. And so next week, God, when, when those decorations have changed, when the bells are gone, and even as this series you know, wraps up, may it not be the end of our passion to take Jesus to the rinks and to the schools and to the marketplaces and to the neighborhoods, to take light into dark places. May we do our part in being your witnesses. And may they do their part in receiving you. And Lord, we just trust you to do your part in drawing all people to your loving arms. Thank you that you pursue us. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God chases us down. Will you stand with me as we close? Hello. Hi. I actually just want to kind of share something that, um, yeah, an experience that's really similar to kind of what Jonathan's been talking about with evangelism. Um, sometimes God will call us to do the, the simplest, smallest things that might even seem weird, but will make a huge difference. Um, I was just worshiping last, last Monday night, um, just at my place. Uh, I live in a basement apartment, so I was just, like, listening to music, and I felt God calling me, so I was just like, God, like, lead me. Where are you leading me right now? And I felt him calling me to sing. Well, I'm like, oh, it's 1130 at night. There's people upstairs. <laughs> so I drove to the church parking lot. I live in St. Catharines and uh, have a church there as well. And so I drove there, and I'm, like, singing my heart out. Cop comes by, and I tell him, oh, I'm just worshiping, you know. <laughs> but um, on my way out to uh, the parking lot where I was worshiping, um, before I got there, I saw a homeless man on my street um, going through garbage and stuff, and I felt called to, to get him a tea, and so I got him a tea and a tea biscuit, um, and I came back, and I couldn't find him, um, so I drove around the area a little bit, and I'm like, okay, I just still don't see him. I'm just going to go home, and I just, I really felt God calling me to, like, go find him, bring him this tea and tea biscuit, like, you saw him for a reason. I called you out to worship at this time for a reason, and so I get in my drive, and I'm like, no, God, really, it's kind of weird. It's like 12 o'clock. This is kind of sketchy. Like, are you sure? But um, I knew that it was God calling me to do this, and so I kept driving around, driving around, eventually found him, um, kind of pulled over and uh, gave him the tea and said, you must be cold. He said, oh, I'm used to living in the cold, and um, I felt God telling me to invite him to church. So I invited out to him out to church, um, told him he can come next Sunday, and uh told him all about it, like where it's located and everything, and um, he was he was so excited, um, started to talk to me a little bit, um, and then I was leaving, he was like, what's the name of church again? Like, I want to make sure I go, and I was like, oh, this is cool. So I like to, kind of at the end, how you were talking about um, God is responsible for the results. I have no idea if he ended up going to church. I don't know if he went this past Sunday or today or next Sunday. I don't know um, when he'll go or what the plan is, but God's got a plan for this, right? He sent me to do this one little thing. Um, and then God is responsible for the results, and it's amazing kind of how he uses us um, to do those little things, and, you know, miracles can come out of it. So I just wanted to share that.